Hi everyone, my name is Pierce. I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series here at Brooklyn Booksmith and your host for tonight's conversation. I want to open up this space by saying thank you for coming out tonight. The Booksmith has been around since 1961 and that's because of our wonderful community. Your support means we can keep having events like this, so thank you again. As you may know, tonight's event is part of our ongoing Transnational Literature Series, which focuses on stories of migration, the intersection of politics and literature, and works in translation. If you enjoyed tonight's event, please check out our full events lineup online at brooklinebooksmith.com so you don't miss some of the amazing authors we have coming up this fall, both virtually and in store. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates. Toward the end of the event, we will leave around 15 minutes or so for an audience Q&A, followed by a signing. We have copies of Tiamo, The Pastor, and Love available over at the counter. And please take a moment to silence your cell phones. I think that takes care of the business end of things. <laughs> So now I'd love to tell you a little bit about our guests. Tonight I have the very great honor of introducing author Hannah Orstovic and moderator Nina McLaughlin here to discuss and celebrate the release of Tiamo, a penetrating study of passion, suffering, and loss from one of the most admired and prominent writers in contemporary Norwegian fiction and international literature more widely. Hannah Orstovic published her first novel, Cut, in 1994 she has written a number of acclaimed novels that have been translated into more than 16 languages and has been awarded a host of literary prizes, including the De Blug Prize, presented annually for Swedish and Norwegian fiction by the Swedish Academy. Martin Aiken's English translation of Love was a finalist for a National Book Award and the winner of the 2019 Penn Translation Prize. And in 2021, Archipelago published his luminous translation of her novel, The Pastor. And tonight's moderator, Nina McLaughlin, is the author of Wake Siren, Ovid Resung, the acclaimed memoir Hammerhead, and most recently, Summer Solstice, an essay. Formerly an editor at the Boston Phoenix, she worked for nine years as a carpenter and is now a books columnist for the Boston Globe. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, the Virginia Quarterly, N Plus One, the New York Times Book Review, the Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. I'm so pleased to have them here together in conversation. And now, Hannah and Nina. Thank you, Pierce. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, and especially, thank you, Hannah. I'm thrilled for this conversation. Um, Hannah's going to read to us to start, and then we'll get into the conversation. There. <laughs> I just wanted to say hello to. And that I'm very happy to be here. Uh, also, before we start, I also want to say that a year ago we had an online event here, and then I talked with Lisa. Where is Lisa? There she is. And that was wonderful, and that made us kind of start a friendship, Lisa and I. So it's so strange that tonight I'm here live, and you are live here. So, so. That is a beautiful kind of voyage in time. I will, uh, I will, uh, I will just read a little passage of of Tiamo uh, in Norwegian, and then I will read uh, the same passage in a little longer in English. Jeg elsker deg. Vi sier det til hverandre hele tiden. Vi sier det i stedet for å si noe annet. Hva skulle det andre ha vært? Du, jeg holder på å dø. Vi, ikke gå fra meg. Jeg, jeg vet ikke hva jeg skal gjøre. Før, Jeg vet ikke hva jeg skal gjøre uten deg, når du ikke er her mer. Nå, jeg vet ikke hva jeg skal gjøre med disse dagene, denne tiden, hvor døden er det mest synlige i alle ting. Jeg elsker deg.
I love you. We say it to each other all the time. We say it instead of saying something else. What would that something else be? You, I'm dying. Us, don't leave me. Me, I don't know what to do. Before, I don't know what I'll do without you. When you're not here anymore. Now, I don't know what to do with these days, all this time in which death is the most obvious of all things. I love you. You say it at night when you wake up in pain or between dreams and reach out for me. I say it to you when my hand finds your skull which has become small and round in my palm now that your hair is almost gone or when I stroke you gently to get you to turn over and stop snoring. I love you. Once I would reach out in the night to touch your skin, to place my hand on your back, your stomach, your thigh, anywhere at all, and there'd be connection, contact. And in that feeling of skin and warmth, something small and without language, something perhaps undeveloped in me, a newborn part could sink down to sense the base of night return home or arrive. I love you, but you are no longer in your body. I don't know where you are. I wash in morphine. You drift in and out of sleep or languor, and we do not talk about death. I love you, you say to me instead, and reach out for me from the bed on which you lie through the days, fully dressed, writing on your phone, writing a novel on that little screen, two or three lines at a time before, before you drift into sleep again. And I let go of the, door, of the door frame and step towards you and take your hand and look at you and say, I love you too. Thank you so much. I want to say to you and I want to say to everyone else, um, there are certain books that sort of light up your brain or entertain you. Um, and there are other books that alter your insides. And that, that's how this book felt to me, that it was one of these books that sort of changed how I was moving through the world um, and really blasted apart some stuff. And so I hope, I mean, I say this to you so you, you guys all read it um, and to you to just sort of honor it and thank you. Um, in, in your novel, Love, which came out over 20 years ago, is that right, originally? It came out in 97? 97, yeah, so even more than that, 25. So that, that novel is um, saturated with this atmosphere of fear. Um, and it's about a mother and a son, and it's suspenseful, um, and it's, it's frightening. And I think that it's frightening in kind of a suspense way, and also in a this great human fear of not, or the question of, can I be loved? Am I lovable? And then in Tiamu, there is the other great human fear of death. But to me, this book is not about fear, or much less about fear. That's not the atmosphere. And so I wonder if you could talk about how your relationship to fear has changed as related to love over the last 25 years. Nina is such a wonderful uh, 
she has kind of pinned out what I'm kind of what I'm working on in, in my newest novel. And when I turn back, I see that the newest novel, which is really, it's not published yet. I'm working on it. It's really working on on on, on fear, and and fear related to love, and and how to kind of get under fear, and what is under fear. So, so I will not start to talk about. That. I will just say that there is a big, big, big line. So your, your really, your question is at the core of all my books. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think those two novels, they are so extremely. Di well, first I just I don't really, I don't think that I would know how to draw the big line of that fear thing but if I'm going to say something about the fear in love I don't have the English copy here uh, it's nice to kind of just you know show it thank you <laughs> thank you so much so this is how it this looks uh, and in, in this novel, um, which was the third novel I wrote, um, and I wrote it when I was 20, uh, I must have been 25, 26, 27, around there. Uh, I wrote it when my daughter was newly born. Uh, she was uh, just born and, and, uh, and uh, I held her in my arms and I had this extreme hearing question how will I ever know how will I be sure to know that she knows that I love her because and, and to me at that time that was a very kind of language question because you can say it and say it and mm. say it but when are the words filled when is I love you really when is there love there in I love you or when is it just you know empty words uh, so I really wanted to kind of write a novel to explore what is love, what is love, and I had to write it because I didn't know, and I think I have written, I think all my novels are in some way quests about love, what love is and, and how is it possible, all kinds of love, and in the past it's more kind of how Am I acceptable in a community, or, or, or should I just vanish? Should I just, you know, retire and, you know, not have to do with other people? Am I, can I be, you know, acceptable? Am I welcome in some way, in a deep level, not, not, but in a very kind of existential level? But I think the big fear in love, I, um, I wrote it really kind of. It, love is written in the present tense. And and I didn't know what was going to happen, so it was. Uh, it, but I really wrote it on fear. I think all the things that is hap they are doing, all the things that they are doing in the novel are are to me very scary things. I mean, to me, a fun fair. Is that what they call it in English? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, fair, fun fair. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's one of the most scariest places <laughs> in the world. <laughs> it's so superficial, mm -hmm. and you're supposed to have fun. But I have always felt that there must be something more underneath. And that seems so scary, the thing underneath seems so mm -hmm. scary. So that's, you know, one of the extreme, extremely scary things. So, so the whole book, I've, I've written it on fear. But now, looking back on it so many years after, I really feel that the real fear in love is exactly what you said to start with it is it's the fear of being uh, it's the fear of, of being outside love of being locked out of love in some way or not ever enter so and I think that is the biggest fear in our lives yeah. I mean you know and I wonder too so this is this is a, a little bit of a tricky question. Um, it's a novel, but some of it also maps onto your experience. Um, 
and, and I've been thinking about the words Ti amo, or I love you, or in Norwegian, will you say it again in Norwegian? In Norwegian, we can say, Jeg elsker deg, which is really, I love you, but but often, at least, I would say, Jeg glad i deg, yeah. which is kind of more, it sounds more Norwegian, if mm -hmm. it's closer to the heart in a way. Okay, great, That's this is nice. perfect, this is exactly what I was wondering. What, does it feel different in your body to say I love you in your native language versus in Italian um, do the words carry a different truth you had said at one point in an interview that one of your that you had a terror of being translated um, because you're not choosing the words I'm, and I, I love this uh, and I wonder how like how Physically, does it feel different to to use different words for that that phrase? That is a very good question, but but I think then I would have to answer for real life and not for yeah. writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. No. Well. I think in the beginning, now I've, I've lived now six years in Italy, and now I think it has become really, it feels, it feels, it feels like when I say Ti amo, it feels like I, I say, um, yeah, I should lie, like, mm. uh, but, but in the beginning I really had, with Luigi, my husband, um, that I write about in, in, in Ti amo, I really had to kind of write, I often wrote to him a text message in Norwegian, saying it in Norwegian, mm -hmm. mm. but, but then, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and, and there is quite a lot in the book about what, what we know in our bodies, and there's a section about sort of the narrator having a sense that maybe her husband is ill before, before it's determined. And there's also another part in which um, the husband sort of uh, wants to throw a New Year's party and the narrator is so against it and gets sick and there's a sort of the body answers. Um, and, and you write that we don't take that knowing seriously until after the fact. And I wonder why do you think that is? What, why, why do you think we don't trust that until, until later? Well, I think we can train ourselves to trust it more and to and to be more aware or kind of, kind of be more attentive to the signals or, or to what we are really feeling. But I think we have to kind of train it again because I think we are so used to we're so used to to be kind and to, to take care of you know mm -hmm. to to to, tr to do the right thing. And, but maybe sometimes the right thing is not really what you want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I don't really know how to answer to that. I, it's you have very good questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to kind of to say that because because you are treating the novel as in a very kind of decent literary way because it is it is a literary work. But I also want to say that it's called a novel, mm. and, and it was my Norwegian publisher who decided uh, to, to call it a novel, and I think that it was also kind of very pragmatic, because in Norway, if you give it a book and it's called a novel, you get a, uh, you get a very good uh, support from the state for publishing it. So, so kind of novels, if I had called it a memoir or something mm -hmm. else, it would have kind of less easily, the publishing house would have less easily get supported. So to me it's, it's really not important that it's called a novel. I really don't like uh, to call it, I would not call it a memoir because that feels like it's kind of something that has re already happened and you're writing about something past and you're kind of memorizing it <laughs> because this is not it. But, but I, uh, I would just like to say it so that so that I, that so that I feel more free when we talk about it because, because to me, to me, I would just 
want to call it a document. Yeah. It's a document. It's a literary document. Yeah. This is. I'm, I feel relieved that you're saying this because reading it, it did feel. I mean, it's. It feels weird to say, oh, the narrator. It did feel so much like, oh, I'm. I am. It's me. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's great. Um, but then, of course, maybe it's not me yeah, anymore yeah. because yep. two years has ha right. have gone. I mean maybe it's not me anymore and that is also literature yeah, yeah and that is also text so and that is the relief of text too so something is fixed in the text and then li life goes on so that every reader and also myself as a reader of my own text can have a new dialogue with the text so when i read it again now i don't i don't longer feel totally the eye of the book is not totally longer me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is also a relief. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, one of the things that comes up in the book is is the idea of life force, and um, uh, you have an encounter in Mexico City that um, that you write about, sort of returning your life force to you, um, and. And earlier in the book, you, you describe your life force as a compulsion for truth. And then during this encounter in Mexico City, it's, um, you write about it that it's, it's a heat between your legs that radiates up into your abdomen. And it's, to me, uh, it's, it's erotic, you know? And, it's, and, and I guess what I'm so curious, whether you feel that that life force is in its most fundamental place an erotic force that is also a wonderful question i would we have to come back to that because i i would i would just like to say uh, how many here have, have uh, read the book someone has read it but a lot of people have not i just i would just like to kind of say a little what the book is about for people who haven't read it is that okay would you like that uh, this is uh, Tiamo is uh, is is that okay with you too? Oh my yeah, gosh, totally. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Tiamo is it, it, it's uh, it's I called it a document. Um, I met Luigi, my husband, uh, in in May twenty six two thousand sixteen, in in a literary festival in 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 Norway where. A foreign publisher were invited uh, to meet, uh, oh, and and some Norwegian writers were kind of invited to present their works for these for these uh, publishers. And I was one of them, and Luigi was one of. She was an he was an Italian publisher, and uh, and uh, and that was. That was the day we put inside our rings when we got married. Mm -hmm. uh, that we we found each other that day in 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 in, in, in May in Norway, and 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 half a year later I went uh, to to Milan in Italy to live with him, and and two years later he 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 got cancer, and and he lived for another two years with the sickness. So, so we had four years together, and 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 this book. Uh, this text, I wrote it after one and a half year of sickness. Uh, I wrote it in January 2020. Uh, uh, and I, 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 um, all these things that we have been talking about are kind of linked to the, to the fact of writing it because... Um, mm, because Luigi uh, did not... Uh, he did not... He he totally. How do you say it here? He refused to die, and he refused to acknowledge that he was going to die. He kind of chose to listen to when the doctor said, "Oh, this is something you will live with." The, the Italian doctors they would not be as the Norwegian ones. The Norwegian ones would say, "Okay, we're sorry, but you're going to die." Mm -hmm. But the Italian ones, they were kind of, you know, play, playing it by the air, ear, I guess that's what you say. And, 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 and they kind of, he did not want to hear. So he, so he kind of chose to, to hear other things that, 
okay, there would be medication, there would be treatments he could live on for, you know. Um, but uh, uh, just uh, just before New Year, the, you know, the 13th of, of December, we were in the hospital, he was doing chemo, and, and at the moment he was outside the room, and I was together alone with the, with the oncologist, and, and I asked, and, and I said, I need to know, please tell me, how, 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 how much more time is there? I will not tell him, but I really need to know. And he said, not one year from now. Not one year, uh, probably maybe half a year, but probably less. And, and, uh, and, and, and to kind of to hear that so clearly uh, uh, did something to me. Uh, even though I knew, hmm? but and then and then we went out of hospital, and Luigi wanted to have this New Year party. <laughs> That's something we'll, we can talk about that. But 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 anyhow, uh, so so uh, so we came home home in January, and what had happened was, well, he had been ill for one and a half. He, he was my big love. I mean, he we he was the kindest most wonderful person I'd ever met. I mean, it, it was wonderful to live with him. And, 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 um, but he was dying and his energy, you know, and I was so close to him. We, we did everything together. We went to the hospital always together because I could, you know, work everywhere. So I could, you know, work there and well. Uh, but then I went, as Nina said, I went to Mexico, I went to Guadalajara, uh, to the big book fair there. And I met this man, this uh, this Mexican man who was a host for me. He so he he, he picked me up at the airport in Iowa, and nothing happened, nothing happened. But it was a love meeting. It was a really kind of deep spiritual kind of meeting with another soul, with another person. But it was also extremely erotic. It was also extreme. It was you know when you really meet someone and you just like, feel that your whole body is put on fire. And you don't know what to do with it, and 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 so it was. But nothing happened between us, like you know, physically. Well, we were just, we just had this extreme, extreme, and I know it was uh, mutual. Uh, uh, and I'm writing about it in the book too. And it was this feeling of of being next to a person and just feeling that love opens that mm -hmm. this moment is filled with love and, and 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 love can be you know everything it can be love for this chair it can be love for you know love for a bird for love for you know it, it's just it's just love opens and that was such a strong and beautiful and wonderful experience but also like nina said also the physical kind of this kind of vulcan of sexuality and life life mm -hmm. force and mm -hmm. of course Luigi had been ill for one and a half year we, we actually hardly hugged him because he had this kind of elect electronic port you know to, to get things so I could never kind of press him to get against me anymore so it kind of the whole physical thing was go was gone we it was a really we had tenderness that was wonderful but but but, but that was not longer there and and, and this meeting with 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 with, with this uh, man in Mexico brought it up again. So coming back from Mexico in December, having this news in the end of end of end of December, and then in January, it was just like uh, the word I, the word I kind of find precise for is is the friction between between the intense the. Int like I'm writing in the book, it, it was just like floating on a, on a river of orgasm, almost. It was so intense in the body, this kind of arousal that the meeting with this man had, had made in me. And then I came home to, to, the, to the man I really loved, and he was dying. And so it was this kind of increpance with, with these two, and, and what to do with that. And we could not talk, and he was dying, and we could not talk about it. So it was all this kind of... So, so so I just sat down for myself I just I just have to have a place where I can go with all these with all these conflicting 
things and, 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 and I sat down to write and I really had no intention of writing for anyone else than myself. I just, I, I needed to write. And, and, but after, uh, and I wrote it in 10 days and it's kind of, it just came out and, and I wrote the first sentences and then I realized, Hannah, no, you're writing. This is not a diary anymore. This is not private. This is not your private. No, you're writing. And that was also such a relief because writing literature is something else than writing for myself. It's, it, it's like it takes me away from myself and brings me closer to myself in the same moment because it's like it's like a sharpness and a, and a concentration and there is something that is really so focused in, in, in the literary writing that it's uh, I don't really know how to say it but, but, but it, it it was kind of It was like seeing clearer where I was because I could write it uh, as literature. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It mm -hmm. hardly makes sense to myself. Mm -hmm. I don't. Maybe in ten years I can tell you better about it. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's amazing. One of the main tensions of the book is is this this desire that you have of sort of saying. This feeling of why can't we talk about it? Wanting to sort of look it in the eye. This 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 death that is coming up, you know, um, and this coming up against the wall that for your husband he didn't want it. Um, and there's in in Mexico City you write of walking along with this other man and talking, and this feeling that you're speaking sort of on the surface of things. Everything has this lightness to it, and that. And then you stop talking, and it's the silence that speaks. And it was so striking to me that it was like, oh, this like this tension of like, why can't we say it? Why can't we say it? And then in this other place, this like, oh, it's the silence that communicates. And maybe this goes back to what you were just saying, that you came back from that and were opened to what could come out. Um, so I don't know if there's a question there, but I guess just this, I don't know, this beautiful tension and balance between what is said and not said and when that can be like oh, like a, like a, a something that's painful and when it's the most c communicative act. Um, that's such a good, those thoughts are so important. It's interesting. Uh, these last days, I think we have been talking a lot about it, traveling around me and Jill uh, from the Archipelago book, uh, about what what do we talk about and what do we not talk about in the relationship. I guess that that's valid also for friendship. I mean, what um, and sometimes sometimes things are just left without words, and that can be the best. And, and the kind of huge room you can give it instead of going in there and kind of because words are often kind of too small for the density of and I think that's also why literature yes I think that is also why literature is such a rel relief compared to a diary or because because literature is image it is images and you can go into the Im and an image you can go into an image from so many angles. So and an image is always so much richer than the analogy of one word after the other explaining something. Because it's not explaining, it's opening a space to live it and to be it and to kind of so so, so, so that's the literature that's the relief of literature I think that you can be there, you can feel it, not only say it and think it, it's it's, it's it's the density of it that opens in, 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 in literature in some way. 
And now I have taken myself far away from what you were <laughs> going to. What did, what did, did you actually? Because it was a very interesting interview. I, I mean, my it wasn't actually even a question. It was, no, it was about the these time, balance. Yeah. yeah, of the yeah. Yes, and it is interesting because between Luigi and me, it was a lot of things that we never talked about. And and now afterwards, I I think a lot about that. Uh, for instance, I was new in Italy, and there were so many things I didn't know about the Italian society that he would never explain to me. And afterwards, <laughs> I'm, I was kind of, why didn't he do that? In a way, it was kind of, did he want me to explore those things by myself? You know, to do my mistakes and then, you know, learn how it was. To be the, I don't really know why. Uh, but I think also that I, I really think he loved me so much that he never wanted to correct me. Mm -hmm. He never really wanted me to feel that I was wrong. So I, But it is really... Uh, and I'm still asking myself now afterwards, I mean, in the new novel that I'm writing now, of course, there is the, uh, I mean, this is the kind of rawness of being very close to that, but, but then for a couple of years I have not written anything at all because, because after losing him, words felt so meaningless, mm. and so, and also writing literature, it was just, Jesus, mm. who cares? Mm. Yes, everything felt meaningless, and, and uh, but then slowly, slowly it was necessary again to write. But I really, I'm really questioning a lot that now, if we had talked about that, what a big difference would it make? Actually, in a way, now I'm kind of asked, maybe it wasn't that. I mean. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of saying to okay, if we had talked, he could have said to me something that maybe, you know, when I'm, I think I saw some film once, and it was someone who said that, oh, when I'm gone, you can go out and you can look at that tree, and you can, it makes me cry, so, <laughs> but kind of you can look at that tree and, and you can think that that I'm inside that tree, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. something like that. But, but then, I mean, how much would that tree help me? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't, so it's, I've kind of come to kind of, to just kind of accept that was how it was, and, and that was as, maybe as good as, as something else. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a moment where you talk about the limits, the sort of, you know, he, talking, you were talking with your husband about, about sex and sort of what the limits are. And in, in some ways it, it felt like that was one of those moments in the book that I was like, wow, like it felt so, so honest, you know? Um, and not in this kind of like flashy way, but just in like, yeah, maybe there are, maybe there are just limits, you know? Um, you were, what do you mean limits, like when he said that maybe this is my sexuality? Exactly. That, it, that it's not kind of raw and violent? Totally, maybe it's, yep. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. No, no, not Yeah, this. yeah, and so that, I mean, I guess it was, it's, it, it's, in sort of, in what you're saying about communicating with him about, or not communicating with him about death, uh, death that like there, there are limits, you know? Um, and. You talked about writing this very quickly, and that it sort of poured out of you, and that it does—it feels like a, a bodily, a physical book. You know that it doesn't—it doesn't feel like sharp and brainy in the in the best way. You know, like it feels like this was this outpouring. Um, and I, I I am curious about whether that is like it's it's the combo of the sort of brain and body and mystery that sort of comes forth. 
Oh, and that's I, beautiful. Where is the mystery? The mystery, I feel like, is, is in the sort of, like, and with love as well, the sort of, um, the atmosphere, that it's sort of like, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm in your books, it's, it's, it's being under a spell. It is being taken into a completely different atmosphere. And, um, and this is a way that's, I think that like, you can have a very big brain and write a very smart book and not, not have that kind of gut impact on someone, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that it's, there is this something else and I don't know what the word is, that comes across in your work. And I guess what I'm trying to get at finally is when you're writing, has it been, or is it usually this kind of pouring forth, this kind of bodily experience of here it comes, here it comes, or is it sort of more like, okay, I'm gonna have an outline, I'm gonna have, you know, tell me how it feels to write. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> no, I think I I really write. Uh, uh, I think, and I think that's also why it, it's so so. I know there are a lot of writers here tonight, so I I would like to say we, oui. uh, <laughs> but um, this mm, I love it because it's all the things at the same time. I mean, you have to kind of, you know what you're doing and you know that what you're saying is kind of, lead, it's kind of, it is a line and, and has connections to all these different uh, parts and uh, So there is, and I really love, one of the things I really find is so beautiful with a novel is, is the construction, the, the kind of, the, the, the architecture of the book in some way but but to me it's all about the the, the in Norwegian the word would be clung the clung the clung of the, of the language and clung is it's both sound but it's sound it's more like a bell that rings that that makes a clang. It's like a bell that ring and that ringing that kind of the the ampness of of, of the sound and, and 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 that means to me both rhythm mm -hmm. and 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 which word to choose because you can choose. I mean, all these kind of layers of what words to choose if you choose. And I, and I really, I really. Uh, I think when I write, I really want there to be as big a space as possible to feel, to feel, and and then the words have to be kind of not obstacles to feeling. Mm. In a way, they they have to be words that resonates with with emotions more than thought. But of course, the thought has to be inside that emotion. So, so uh, but that is what you. I think I really write very much with my body. Mm -hmm. I feel how it has to be, and I do, 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 and it has to have rhythm. Yeah. And I, and if it doesn't kind of go out with those kind of syllables, then I have to find another uh, uh, way to yeah mm -hmm. to write that sentence. Yes. That makes yeah that that I mean even you know it's it, it's strange. It, I'm nodding and saying yeah yeah yeah, uh, and I'm reading you in English. I mean it is. I think that Martin Aiken. I don't know. I mean. I, that sense comes across even in the English. That's beautiful. But he is such a wonderful translator. So thank you, Martin. <laughs> yeah. um, let me open it up to you guys um, if you have questions for Hannah. Can I just, first of all, I'm Norwegian. So it, it was so lovely that you read that first paragraph in Norwegian. Because it, I think when it comes to language, I've lived here since Can you 19... stand up so they hear yeah. you? I've, I've okay. lived here since 93. This is my local bookstore, so mm. I can walk here. Oh, you're and... so lucky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, it, it's so lovely when you did it in Norwegian, because it, I, 
think it's still, I'm married to an American in New York, but I still, it hits me differently mm -hmm. when you say it in Norwegian. And I think also the clown of Norwegian is so different. And, and the word, but I would say I, I moved here in 93, and, and so I'm always hunting for your books mm -hmm. when I'm back in uh, Norway, because okay. what I find so fantastic with your books is that the way you put the women into your stories, the truth telling, the, it, it sort of hits me really. It, even if these protagonists or, or those who tell the story, they can be so different from me, but it feels so true. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, I can really, and your images, I, I can really follow you, be there. I, I mean, it, it's really, no, I'm a visual artist, but I used to be a scientist and physician. And, and it's sort of, the, your images are so lovely. So I, it, it is a small, like, praise <laughs> and ask a question. I'm so pleased. I didn't even know, but my lovely daughter, she, she is a, who studies literature here in Boston, she told me about that you would come. And she bought a book for me. So now I get, get to read you in English. I've always read you in English. So thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for what you're saying about being there. I think that is really what I want with my books is, is I think I write them for myself because I need I need them and I need but, but what I need with my books I need to be there. I need to be there and and and, and if it can work like that for, for someone else too. I think to me books are places that are existential places to be and to be with uh, with explorations of, of, of problems and solutions we find in life not in not in the book but in the book we can be there and I think to to really be somewhere is 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 healing in itself somewhere. Thank you. It doesn't have to be questions, it can be also be comments, and it can also be just a thought. I was wondering if you could speak more to the experience of reading yourself in translation. Uh, you were saying that in Italian, saying Tiamo felt true after some years of living in Italy. And I was wondering if you can, when you read yourself in translation, feel that rhythm that you speak of when you write in Norwegian um, or not. Uh, it's exactly what's your name? Hilde Kari. Hilde Kari. Hilde Kari, what's a wonderful combination of two <laughs> names. It's really rare. <laughs> I've never heard of that before in Norway. Hilde Kari. What Hilde Kari said is that uh, it feels differently. Uh, and I think that is the big, the biggest difference is that I don't feel English. I don't feel Italian. Uh, the way the way I feel Norwegian. So in Norwegian, I w if someone else is is quoting me, I can I can just that's wrong. I would never put it that way. And it can just be two words, mm -hmm. something a little low, uh, but I I feel it immediately. You you you're not <laughs> <laughs> right. So but in English, I mean Martin Eichen is doing a wonderful job. But it's not my words anymore, and that it hurts. Yeah. So, 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 so I'm just kind of, I'm so grateful. It's wonderful, but I don't have to read it. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I just don't. Uh, the only thing is, uh, I was extremely uh, involved in the editing of the Italian translation because. Uh, because now my Italian is good enough to, and 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 Tiamo is so short that I did it with a very good friend who who is uh, an editor. So it, we had the translation and we worked upon it together with every single word mm -hmm. in Italian, so that the Italian version would, would be good. But it's still kind of it's it's still so yeah. So, you raise your hand. Yeah, I had a couple of comments. 
you had mentioned a few things. One if you was, stand up for me, sure. oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, a couple of comments. You said some things that I really enjoyed listening to. One, I'm thinking that the way you describe I haven't read your book yet, but the way you're describing it, it sounds like it could be poetry. Poetry is this, the concept of you using your body. And the other thing that I was thinking about was the declaration piece. The writing of a book, I'm writing a book too, and the concept of how important it is to put it not in a journal alone, but mm -hmm. in a book for others to read is almost like an act of declaring. And the process that you went through, which was, I can already feel it, I haven't read the book yet, but something that so many people can relate to with loss and love and death, which is inevitable, it's almost like you're declaring your truth so you could be seen. Mm -hmm. or you could be validated, you could be heard. And you're also talking about this incredible Kundalini fire, and I'm Indian, and I love that you talk about this life force, which is how we all came to be. No matter how anybody came to be, there is that life force, mm -hmm. and how precious it is that you honored a parallel relationship mm -hmm. that doesn't invalidate the relationship you had with Luigi. It almost enhances it because there's so many ways you can love people. And giving yourself that permission to say, I haven't been hugged, and I want to feel this in my body, but it doesn't take away what I have with my husband. It's just, it was really powerful to listen to. So I just wanted to put those as words that came to me, and I don't know if that resonates to you or to you with how you were trying to speak about it. And thank you for writing this. I bought the book, it's upstairs, I can't wait for you to sign it. And for me to read it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful what you said, because and when you said it, I, was, I really felt that that was so true what you said about... I think that is also what has been really important for me in my whole life in writing, uh, that this version, this version my version of of reality of how things are is also true that i mean this kind of who is defining the world who is defining reality who is saying how it is and to be able to know it's not like this, it's like this. Mm -hmm. at least it's also like this and to and 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 to to say, say it also because i'm i'm really not I really don't like to talk, and I don't be really believe in, in, in all this talking, and I, I, sometimes I feel a little bit autistic, because there is so much going on when you meet a person, mm -hmm. you look into the eyes, you feel the energy, and there's the body and how you move, and, and they look a little bit away, and then they look back, and there is so much going on, and then you should have a, a plus all these words, <laughs> you're going to think, you're going to oh, put the, everything together, and then and what in the end do you re what do you get to say yes, and yeah. what is the important thing and what you're saying maybe maybe the meeting of the eye mm -hmm. is much more important than the clever words you got to say for two seconds or uh, so so talking is kind of overvalued mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it can also be wonderful mm -hmm. and really important and, and like i mean when people really take the effort to to say the real th what what is really on on their heart, mm -hmm. uh, like you did now, it's kind of to be validated and to, yeah. Uh, but I think that writing t for me, I think I grew up in a family where I was so scared. My father was re really so could be so extremely uh, explosively angry. So I was up, it was, I never felt free to, to be free. I, I never felt free to be spontaneous. That was, that was really, that was really dangerous to be spontaneous. I, I always had to kind of contain myself or, or, you know, we all had to. So I think to me writing was, writing has always been a place that I could totally withdraw because writing is something you do totally alone, I could kind of be there and say it all. Mm -hmm. I could say it all. 
and then I could send the book out in the world. And I didn't have to be there. I didn't have to take that fight. He could be as angry as he would. But I, you know, I was safe. The book was out there and doing it. So, so, and, and I think that was, that protection of, of the protection of the writing room is, 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 is really something. Yes. And it, I mean, that brings me back to, me, to what you were saying about, it's almost like you had to say you're going to die. And you, because you couldn't say it to him, you say it here. You know that that like it 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 it's forced out in some way. Like it has to have a place to go. Um, You're so right. You're so right. I think that was also a very important reason for me to write that book, and writing it. And he lived another half year before he died, and and that half year, if I hadn't had that book, I was often just thinking, I'm so grateful that that text now exists. Because I, it's there. I've said it. I, it's a place where that truth exists. So I don't have to, I don't have to go and confront it with him because he couldn't take it. But but I had a place for it. That's you're so right. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I guess I have um, a question a bit about. I guess. <laughs> a bit about kind of modern trends in Norwegian fiction because I mean just hearing where you I haven't read Tsuyama yet but just hearing especially where you were speaking in Norwegian it really reminded me both of Fur Gritten and a bit of Vitesjot especially uh, for Milieu and like especially that idea of having something that you can't you don't know how to speak about especially like not in a young person's voice but in somebody who's lived a bit more and like has lived with this question a bit more and I was wondering if you like, if you consider yourself kind of somebody within this new, or at least what I see kind of an auto-fictive trend in contemporary Norwegian literature, or if you see yourself a bit on the peripheries of it, or like a stalwart in it, or you know, however you're seeing it. Um, I always <laughs> leave that to the art critics. <laughs> I would not know where to put myself. The only thing I know is that It will be interesting now that I'm getting older, because then... But until now, as I have seen it, uh, I think because my novels somehow opens for strong emotions, it has been hard to kind of... I'm not that interested in that autofiction, uh, so I will not answer it. <laughs> I think it's so boring, and I don't. And I also think that literature has always been kind of autofictional. It's just how we talk about it, and in no way they are, they are obsessed with discussing wherever, whatever, if it's all about your own belly or not. I mean, who cares if the book is good? I mean, so but uh, but what I was going to what. what um, what I started, what did I start to say? I'm really getting it. <laughs> I started to say something. What was I say? Yes, that I think my, I think, I think my novels, uh, in some way, for a lot of critics in Norway, they are unpleasant because they arouse strong feelings. And I think a lot of people don't know what to do with strong feelings. Bec and, and, and if strong feelings are written, uh, by a, a woman, often they are kind of a little bit dismissed not to have enough brain. You, you, either you have feelings or you have brain. Uh, and, and I don't think, and I think that is so, also Jesus, yeah. wake up. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, yes. And, and, I, and I feel like I was, you know, saying that there's a, there's a lot of force and, and sort of making that kind of distinction between body and brain. That's not to say that like there there is obviously an enormous brain throbbing at the heart of these two. You know, I think that's I, I like that's I think and maybe that's where the mystery comes in. You know, that it's this beautiful combination of like the physicality, the kind of like pure intelligence, which is so apparent, 
and and this kind of the depth and expansiveness of the emotion. Wow, that was really beautiful. I would have taped that. <laughs> and whenever I'm doubtful, I would listen to you again and again. <laughs> Yes, but but yes, but there is something about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, how how. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, way way in the back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I do agree with the kind of mm -hmm. air of mystery mm -hmm. that you were talking about. I feel like when I'm reading, I'm halfway through the past and I have read love. I think therapy is a wonderful thing, <laughs> but luckily I think literature is something else. I think I think literature. Uh, I think. I think the most healing thing about literature is the beauty. Mm -hmm. And, and and when you say mystery, when you say, I think all these things that the 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 rhythm, the toe. I mean, what what is really like in the pastor? In in the pastor, uh, I can answer this question in so many ways. Of course, I write to change myself. I write to, I write. To, I write to live. I don't. I, I don't live to write. I, I write to. Li I really like this. I. I, I really want to, do, to. I really want to to learn how to to live, and that's why I write. So in a way, but um, but for instance, the pastor when I wrote it. It, it is really kind of, to me, uh, it, uh, I wrote it in, two, in 2003, it came out in two, 2004, and that was a period when I was, uh, it was, uh, uh, to me it was really a, a, a novel I wrote uh, on the limit of life and death, I mean, should I kind of come back to community, society, other people, or, or, or should I just leave it all? Should I just, you know, as she says some way in the book, just walk mm -hmm. into the water and just keep on walking, like there is no limit anymore. You can just, you know, walk into death in some way. And, 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 and the, the main character in, in, in the pastor is called Liv, which means life in Norwegian. Uh, uh, and and she and it is a lot about to me the pastor is a novel about language does language what I also t said about love is is there love in love I mean mm -hmm. where is the love in, in, in the word love and, 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 and the pastor leave is kind of struggling with with language and and, and, and the impact of language, and that's also the mystery of the Sami God. So there are a lot of layers in, and, and discussions of that in the novel. But, but in some way, in some way, in that novel, there is nothing that promises to hold. I mean, mm -hmm. language doesn't hold. Nothing, nothing is really holding. Mm -hmm. But what I what, what what was my feeling with that novel is that uh, the meaning of the world words in the novel does not hold. They don't promise to hold. I mean, grace, God, 
grace of God be with you. You can't promise that. You can save her. But but what is holding in the novel is is the language itself. The beauty of language is holding. So if if, if everything is gone, uh, le fleur du mal, I mean, the, the, the beauty is, uh, and, and the tone and the rhythm, I, it's almost like, I think to me, to me the pastor was almost like leaning into a mother, and the mother, and the mother of, the mother, the mothering of language that is no longer the brain of language, the, no longer the thought of language, but the sound of language, the holding of the language. It, to me, it's really kind of, to me, in, in the Norwegian version of love, no, of, of the pastor, it is really this, the, the quality of the language is kind of, I hold you, I hold you, no matter what, language holds you, and you can die, but, but it's, there's still an embrace here, something holds, and, and that, to me, is, is, is that quality of warmth in, in, in the language in that novel. And and I'm so curious how it is in English. I have never I haven't seen it, but you know I it, it seems that like Martin has has carried it. And that I, I feel like that is maybe a beautiful place to wrap up. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you Anna so so much. Um, thank you Nina. Yeah, my pleasure, absolutely. Um, and thank you to the booksmith, Lisa Pierce. Um, and, you know. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I didn't have the heart to break you guys up. That was a real <laughs> meeting of the minds. It was beautiful to watch. Thank you.